earlier. My name is Faye Davis, and I am the Assistant Director of Sustainability for Outreach and Engagement, and I am going to be in seeing this event for you today, so you'll see a lot of me. Um, go ahead and get started um, so we don't waste any time. Um, so uh, the, uh, you are in the, in the community breakout session. And uh, the description of the session, the majority of environmental change makers agree that the most accessible way to make a positive impact on the environment is to vote for policymakers who care about the environment. <laughs> we all have the power to make an impact in the community by voting and being an active, engaged citizen. Uh, get involved in your local community and democracy at all levels. And today you will learn how you can use your vote and your voice um, to make a difference. Um, before we get started, I do want to uh, thank our sponsors for this event. And um, you can see uh, most of them in the exhibit hall. Um, the Carbon Almanac Network, um, Encore, Train, U.S. Ecologic, and wear them out teas. Um, so thank you to all of our sponsors for this event. So um, without further ado, please welcome our panelists for today. Um, Rudy Bush, editor of the Dallas Morning News editorial pa page, um, will uh, moderate this session. Welcome, Rudy Bush. <laughs> um, we have, he is joined by Barbara Larkin, Vice President of Voter Services. Um, who will uh, discuss the challenges and opportunities voters face um, in the future. And um, last, uh, Anaya Henderson, Community Ambassador of the Citizens Climate Lobby, uh, who will discuss bipartisan climate legislation for nonprofits um, and uh, who are advocating with national legislators. Uh, our panel will be taking questions after their presentations from both our live audience and our um, virtual audience. Um, and please um, uh, put in the code on your mobile devices and you can send in their questions during their presentation. And I will, um, I will moderate those questions to them at the end. Um, so without further ado, Mr. Bush, please take it away. Summit. Uh, grateful to be with these two esteemed panelists uh, to talk about these sort of political and uh, uh, social questions that we have around uh, climate. And, and one of the things that my newspaper has focused on recently in a series we call The American Middle is looking at the ways that Many Americans actually see complex social problems, including climate change, with much more nuance than the way that they are necessarily presented in our, in our political lives or the, 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 the sort of binaries that, we, that we're faced with when we get to the voting booth. It's, it's a reality that uh, seven out of ten Americans say that they have experienced some sort of extreme climate, some sort of extreme weather. Uh, within their communities within the past year. Uh, eight out of ten Americans accept that climate change has played a role in, that, uh, in those events. At the same time, it's, it's really difficult, as we know, to get to political solutions around climate. And I think it's really valuable to spool back and think about why that is. It's a fact that the oil and gas industry is one of the largest employers in the state of Texas. Millions of people rely on that industry for their livelihoods. It's a fact that uh, all of us in this room rely at some level on fossil fuels as part of our, our, uh, our lives. It's also a fact that the state of Texas is the largest producer in the nation and one of the largest producers in the world of renewable wind energy. And we rely as a state on both of those industries for our way of life. So I think when we start to think about the nature of these uh, problems that, that, that we have or the, or, the, or, the, or the way that we have structured our society, it becomes clear why it's really difficult to get towards solutions. And it's important to us as a, as a newspaper to try to find places of common ground, to try to find 
places of solution, and I know that's what this summit is about today, and I know that's what uh, the two people to my right work really hard on trying to, to bring us towards both from the political perspective and from the and from the policy perspective. So I wonder, Barbara, if you could just talk a little bit about your work, uh, and then Anaya, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your work, and then we can have some questions for you both. Sure. I'm Barbara Larkin with the League of Women Voters of Dallas. We are a nonprofit whose mission is to empower voters and defend democracy. Um, what we've do, been doing, we do um, a lot of things, but what my main mission is to educate and register voters and to inform voters and make them confident. So we have a whole team. We have about 300 volunteers, and we have about 30 to 50 that are extremely active on all the college campuses. And so we have spent hundreds of hours out at Dallas College campuses um, in the last two months. We do it, we always kind of, you know, two months before elections. We're also out there <clears throat> on various, you know, times talking to students, um, talking to people about uh, understanding the process, how to navigate the process, how to think about the process, because what we have found is that in talking to students, so many of them uh, lack confidence in the process. And Texas is one of the hardest places to vote in the country. We get, we get voted in the bottom five pretty much by every think tank in America every year. And so when people say, oh, it's so simple, it's so simple, well, not really. It's not that simple for whole swaths of people. And um, so what we do is go and, and actually talk one by one to people. I mean, I sit very unintimidatingly in a vote shirt with a big bowl of Kit Kats and Snickers. And so most of my universe of people I talk to like chocolate. Um, but, you know, you do what you have to do to get people to feel comfortable to talk to you. Because voting, it turns out, is very personal. It's sort of a personal thing. There's a lot of your personal information. There's a, a lot of times you have family things going on in voting. And uh, so people come to us and say, I don't know what to do. And we literally just talk them through the process and give them confidence that they can participate in the process. Hello, everyone. My name is Anaya Henderson. Um, I'm a native Texan. I grew up always knowing how important and how enjoyable nature is and should be. Um, I graduated from the University of Oklahoma with a biology degree, and I started teaching just last school year. Um, and last year I taught aquatic science. And when I was doing a lot of research to prepare for my presentations for my students, um, we got to talk about pollution, we got to talk a little bit about climate change, and to be able to dive deep into those topics, I was horrified with, you know, the things that, you know, we humans do and how we treat our oceans and how we treat our environments and, um, you know, not just dumping oil or toxins into the ocean, but also um, the ways in which ways that we source our natural um, energy can be very harmful for our aquatic animals. And so, I realized that I didn't only want to educate on these topics, I wanted to get involved in a real way that I knew would make an impact. And so the work that I do at Citizens Climate Lobby, I'm a community ambassador, and what we do is we give the resources and tools to everyday people um, to lobby to their members of Congress, to get involved, because we know that you can be mad all you want about what's going on, but if you don't take that power and you don't go out and vote and make your voice heard, um, then it's really hard to expect for those things that you want to get done. So um, at Citizens Climate Lobby, we are a nonpartisan grassroots climate advocacy organization, and we are all about giving that power to everyday people to make change and give them that confidence to go out and speak to their members of Congress and get things done. That's awesome. Thank you. Barbara, you've been in this space for some time of uh, trying to get people to vote. Mr. Martinez was talking about, I think, some of the frustrations people have with the political processes, our systems. Mm -hmm. um, what do you see when you talk to everyday people about, you know, why they're not voting, why, why, why they're making the decision not to go to the booth, not to get registered, whatever it might be? Right. Um, so it's, um, it's a mix. Uh, I, um, I'll say that it's different by age <clears throat> in terms of how people think about voting. Um, our experience with young people right now is they very much want to vote. 
which is a little different because if you t sometimes the group in the 25 to 35 year old, um, that group is a little more in the G voting doesn't matter quadrant. Um, and so that, for us, that's a longer conversation. I'm always like, give me 15 minutes for that person, and I can convince them. Um, the younger people actually want to vote. They are running into all kinds of obstacles. <coughs> um, and it's interesting, because when, if you can help people understand the process of the voting, of navigating the process, and, and it's, it's not, um, it's fairly understandable that, that this younger generation um, feels like they can't trust any information. They feel like they can't, there's, they're, they're, um, they, they feel like there's no place they can go to, to even begin the process. Um, because they've been told, you know, watch out, there's so much misinformation and uh, you know, everything, everybody's lying to you. So they, they're sort of afraid to get started. And so it's interesting, when we go out and talk to people, we always, just so everyone in this room who's, you know, we always say, start with your county elections website. That like, seems like the most boring advice you would ever give someone in the whole world. But I'll just tell you, it, it is always a reputable place to start. And some of the county websites, in fact, all of the North Texas websites, are actually quite excellent in terms of giving you the information to get you started. So if you actually go to your county elections website, you can find out if you're voted. They're registered to vote. I mean, so many people don't vote because they think they're not registered. I was out at North Lake on Wednesday. Um, I, I, you know, I'm sitting there with my bowl of Kit Kats and Snickers. Um, a guy comes up and says, you know, he's very sheepish. He's, he feels horrible. He didn't get it done. He didn't get registered. Ugh. He's just mad at himself. And so I'm talking to him a little bit, and I'm like, all of a sudden he said something. And I said, is there any chance you are registered? Let's look you up. So we look him up. We couldn't find him at first in the Dallas County website. We try again in the state website. He's, he's been registered for two years in Denton County. He didn't know it. He was so happy. It was life-changing for him to find out that he was registered to vote in Denton County. He came back by our table three more times in the hour and waved at us. <laughs> he was like, we made that person's day life. He was going to go to Denton. He was going to vote. He, had, he had, was positive he wasn't registered to vote. Well, he was. People actually are getting registered through the GPS, which is interesting because they didn't used to, but they are now. So there's a whole swath of people out there that are registered to vote that don't know it. And so what we try to do is get them to understand you are registered, no, you are registered to vote, you know, then, and then, okay, here's how you go find out who is on your ballot. Here is how you do research on that. And then so we can walk them through the various steps of the process. And we feel like if well, you can get someone to vote once or twice, you pretty much got them. You pretty much, they go, okay, I'm a voter. They, they change how they think about themselves. They literally think of themselves as someone, if that is one thing in their toolbox. I know there's lots of other ways to, you know, make community change, protesting and boycotting, and there's a million ways, but voting is one. And there's no reason to give it up. You might as well give it a shot, right? So we always talk to people about that. You know, you might as well try to vote, right? I mean, it's not going to hurt, you know? So anyways, there's a lot of, a lot of things that we talk to people. I can talk more later about yeah, the group that believes that it doesn't matter. Because that's actually a broader, that's a whole, that's a broader issue. Some of those people are, you know, have a valid argument. And so we talk to them and say, okay, we get what you're saying. Because they're thinking about it a little differently, a little, it's a little different conversation. So. Yeah, I want to get into that. And I want to ask you in a minute about this mistrust question, because I think it's a yeah. really, really important one. Mm -hmm. But Anaya, let, let me ask you this. I think climate is a really interesting question when we study it politically and when, uh, you know, at my newspaper we have a lot of people in politics come, come through and talk to us. And, and what I see is that climate is actually an issue that is not uh, that easily divided on, on left and right as maybe we think it is. There are large groups of sort of conservatives for the environment. Um, and then there are, there are plenty of people on the left who take a lot of money from industries that we uh, you know, see as polluting industries. I'm, I'm wondering when you go and talk to people about uh, climate change, about the impacts on the environment of sort of our, 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 our human society, what, how, what you do to reach them if they seem to be a little bit out of reach, what you say? That is a great question. Uh-oh. Hello? Yeah, I think you're... Okay. <laughs> um, so um, I joined Citizens Climate Lobby in March, 
And since then, I've had the pleasure of being able to speak at different events, educate people at schools, um, and really just get the word out about how they can take the power in their own hands and speak to our members of Congress um, and advocate for climate solutions, robust climate solutions that are really going to make a difference um, and get us to our goals that we need to get to. IPCC says we need to lower global emissions by 50% in the next, um, next eight years. And so how do we do our part um, as a citizen and make sure we're holding our elected officials accountable to do that? So what we... What um, one of our biggest um, values is at CCL is to be an optimist, which can be very hard when you're doing this type of work and you're advocating for our environment. Um, but we like to meet people where they're at. Um, and what I mean by that is that we are not trying to convince everyone that it's happening. Um, so much science and so much research, we know that it's happening. Um, and so the people who do care and the people who do want to advocate for our environment, we like to give them the tools that they need in order to be a productive citizen and help them advocate for climate solutions. So what that looks like um, is we have a bunch of different resources on the Citizens Climate Lobby website where if you are brand new to this and you do not know that much, we help educate you on the basic science. We have climate scientists that give wonderful trainings. We also educate people on how to lobby and lobbying to someone that's more on the left is extremely different than how you'll lobby to someone on the right. So it's how do we go in and be effective knowing our audience and trying to find common ground since we are nonpartisan. We really believe that it takes everyone in order to fix this problem. This isn't a partisan issue, it's a human issue. And so how do we get down to that root and find that commonality? Um, and we want to give people hope because there's a lot of doom and gloom, but we want to make sure that we are being optimists and we are making sure that we're giving that confidence to people and letting them know that your voice does matter. This is how you can use your power, and this is how we can influence our members of Congress to implement robust climate policy. Um, we had high school students in Utah, and they helped pass climate solutions by lobbying to their members of Congress. So. We want everyone to feel this confidence that they can make a change, um, and we try to help them. We meet them wherever they are and help guide them through that process and helping build them as activists um, and as an environmentalist. Yeah, that's, that's great. The, that sense of optimism is it's hard to hold on to, but it makes a huge difference when you walk up to a skeptic, I think. But it, I want to talk a little bit, Barbara, about this area you opened up, which I just see so, so often now. But I, I, want to, I want to talk to you about uh, this sense of mistrust, especially in, in institutions. And one of the things that, that really uh, concerns me as a journalist is I'm, I'm very often approached by people who have the most harebrained ideas, uh, totally false information that they've gathered from someplace on their telephone. And, uh, and, and, what, and, and in, they've, they've also come to distrust things like the League of Women Voters that have uh, you know, generations, really, of, of work uh, that they've done. In fact, we had a number of candidates uh, this election cycle, mainly on the right, but not exclusively, who uh, refused to interact uh, either with uh, our newspaper or with uh, institutions like the, the League. And I just wonder what you... If you can just build on that sense of where you're seeing this mistrust come from, this reliance on disinformation, and how you try to address that as an organization. Okay. Yeah, there's a couple things going on there. The, um, on the, for example, on the Lee Win Voters Printed Voter Guide, um, that, the voter guide, it's also a digital voter guide, um, vote411.org, for anyone that hasn't voted here. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a, a guide that we ask candidates questions, and we, mostly an email, and broad questions, and we write them based on what's relevant right now, and then they answer the questions, and we, we don't edit it. If they smell, spell democracy wrong, we put it in there exactly like that. It's completely unedited. So it's a little different than some of the other guides out there. Um, and uh, we understand one of the things that we saw this cycle was that uh, certain, 
a lot of Republican, but also uh, folks in gerrymandered districts uh, didn't necessarily respond. And, you know, that's a little bit sad for us because that is definitely a sort of, um, you know, gerrymandering is definitely causing democracy to be less responsive to the constituents. I mean, that is exactly what that is. Um, so, you know, we're doing our best to try to encourage everyone, both voters and candidates, that, you know, part of their role in public service is communicating to their constituents how they feel about issues. So, um, you know, we're going to, I feel like we're going to keep at that, you know, that, that concept of trying to get people, because we want democracy to be responsive to the, the people. And it's interesting because some of the, you know, sometimes the, the media has, um, you know, it has this sort of, fixation with the race and, and the kind of always implying that every single representative and politician is all about either money or power. But if you actually go meet many of your representatives, I think you will find that many of them actually are trying to do things for their constituents. Many of them are actually trying to improve the community. Many of them are really working toward that goal. And um, so, you know, we're, we want people to know that that not all, you know, not everybody is sort of a power-hungry politician. A lot of them are really trying to do the right thing and trying to move the society forward and the community forward. So, as, you know, in it, as our role as kind of democracy activists is to connect the voters to these people as much as we can, especially to the ones that care about th furthering society and community in whatever way that is that they view is, you know, representative of, of their constituents. So we're always trying to move that, you know, as much as we can. Um, it's not easy right now. Not easy. It's not easy right now. <laughs> I feel for you. Um, all of us that are trying to get information out are having the same problems. So I'll, I'll stop. No, I, I love that phrase, democracy activist. I think that's, that's beautiful. I'm going to make a shirt for myself. I'm, <laughs> I'm a democracy activist. Uh, we have men in the league. We've been voters, so you could always sign up. <laughs> Well, 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 part of being a, a democracy activist is making space for people who, who disagree to find, find common ground. And, and I know, Anaya, that's something that you guys work a lot on, and you talked a little bit about, about that. But plainly, we're in, a, we're in a time when temperatures are very high, right? And people just don't – they seem to come ready to, for battle, you know, and, and we've all got our armor up. Uh, but how, how do you – Break through that and say, "Hey, let's have let's have a conversation where we can find places where we can make some progress." I love that question. Um, Citizens Climate Lobby is very serious about our values, and so, like I said earlier, one of it is being nonpartisan, and so that gives us a very unique opportunity because we're wanting volunteers from every single political affiliation. We're also approaching every single politician. And so a big part of CCL is we go lobby. So this year was the first year we brought back our, our conference that we have in June that's in D.C. And so we were able to, you know, listen to a lot of speakers. We listened to Sheldon Whitehouse. We listened to a lot of people who are paving the way in clean energy. And at the end, the last day, most people stick around, and that's like our lobby day. And so we go, and we talk to our members of Congress, and what was so eye-opening for me, my first time ever lobbying, and it was in D.C., was before we did that meeting, we did some research, obviously, on our, on our representative. And mine in particular, he's conservative, but what we found is that he's a part of the conservative um, climate caucus. And it's like a lot, of, a lot of times we find ourselves in these echo chambers where people believe the same things we believe, they talk about the same things we talk about, and we don't get that outside perspective. So our wall is up. And so we think that everybody else is the enemy, right? But that situation really opened my mind up that we truly do have a unique opportunity in this time to stop being so polarized and stop being so against each other and realize we have so much more in common than we realize. Um, and so that's a lot of the work that we do. We're, we're nonpartisan. We're also... Um, trying to make sure that we connect with our communities and some work that we do in our community is we partner with the Environmental Voter Project. 
And they are a small group of data scientists who identified environmentalists um, across the nation. And they identify environmentalists who don't vote. And they not only help these people turn out and go to an election and vote, but they consistently help these people show out every single election. Because there are a lot of environmentalists that don't vote. Um, in the 2020 election, we saw that there are over a million environmentalists who just didn't vote. And that could have had a really big impact in a lot of different elections. So um, we, we really try to, I think the way in which we operate and our values opens the door up to a lot more different conversations than you may get um, in maybe other places where everyone thinks the same things. That's, yeah. that's incredibly hard work. Um, it's, it, it, it sounds easy when you say it, but it's incredibly hard. And yeah, and it is not that easy. There are definitely um, politicians who, where they are very close-minded, um, but you meet them where they're at. They're my representative, so I want to create that connection with them and see how we can progress and create some type of climate solution. And um, we've also slightly brought in the things that we support. Historically, it was the Carbon Fee and Dividend Act, which we still support. Um, but we're also moving into forestry. Um, and a big Republican thing that was moved across was the Trillion Trees Act. And so it's like when you dive deep into it, people are trying to, our, our representatives, like you were saying, a lot of them are trying to make an effort. And it's, so how do we meet them there, help them get more educated on what's going on, and how do we move this forward? That's awesome. Well, I, I could ask you guys questions all day because I love asking questions to smart people. I'm lucky enough that that's my job. But I bet there are some really good questions online, and I want to make sure we have time for that or, or, or in the audience. Yes, we certainly do have some questions. <laughs> um, so, um, and I don't know if you guys heard earlier, but we have over 600 people online watching right now. We won't get to yes. <laughs> Uh, we won't get to every question, but um, but we've got um, we've got about ten more, ten to fifteen more minutes where we can take a few. So I've pulled um, the the most common questions from the thread. Um, so let's see. All right, the first question is. Um, why is the voting process so archaic? When will voting become digital and um, maybe possibly vote from our homes, from our mobile devices? So being with voters has been um, the Texas League of Voters has worked hard on this, these issues. They're very supportive of online voter registration, um, you know, same-day voter registration, evolving the, um, the voting systems. Um, it, 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 I can't tell you exactly when that will happen. Um, I do feel like we're making some headway on the online voter registration part of the process, and that um, as we make headway and, that, um, and, it, and the Texas legislature has become more comfortable with that, um, that maybe then we can keep going to the next step and have full online voter registration. And this, this last cycle, we were asking for, could they at least make a change of address online? You know? And so and they, they did. Um, but so uh, we would like to see the Texas legislature um, try harder to make the, all the voting more digital. And um, but one of the things I think, you know, is, Back to the, you know, why voting matters question. Um, one of the things that we often talk to young people about is the fact that just them voting, the, the, the various representatives that are in office actually know who votes. They know that elderly folks voted 85% and young folks voted 30, 25, 30%. And if that switches, we think that the government will become more receptive to these kinds of things that young people want. So sometimes we say, you know, you may vote for someone and not get 100% the outcome. Your person may not win. But that's okay because actually the world knows you voted. And they know that you're 20 years old. And that matters that you vote as a 20-year-old because 
the people that are in office now know that the 20 year olds are voting. So my thought is that the more young people are voting, the more likely we are to get some of these policies to bring us, although more Texas is quite behind, by the way, in terms of this, you know, paper registration and paper this and that, and uh, a lot of obstacles. I could talk for days about obstacles. Um, but, you know, there are ways to, you know, we're sort of trying to whittle away at them. And it'd be great if we could, you know, vote like the way you do, you know, the Zelly Act. Oh, right, that would be great. I don't. I don't think we're quite there. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. Um, this next next question is for Anaya. Um, what steps do you think we could take to create an education system that engages and empowers students to act? That is a wonderful question. Um, we actually work very closely with um, some high school students, and they are they are incredibly bright. Um, and they're giving me a lot of hope that we are continuing to be very great. Um, but what I would recommend is what we've tried actually at a high school in Dallas is we've created these events where it's like a seminar and it's this conversation that we have. Um, first, it's an educational piece of what's going on. And then we have a conversation with those students and we ask them, what's their opinions on this? What do you see the challenges being? And we want them to really think big and see what's going on and how we can approach the situation. Um, but I think it starts with creating organizations and creating groups in your own communities and your own schools. How do we make this a bigger topic? How do we show up? And you can go lobby as a high school student. We have high school students that go and, and lobby to their members of Congress often. And so it's about making sure they know that they can, anyone can, um, and giving them the proper resources and tools that we can to help guide them in that way. And in Citizens Climate Lobby, we have, we have a crazy amount of mentorship. I feel like if you don't know what you're doing and you don't have a clear goal, it's very easy for you to step back and not want to do anything or volunteer. So we do a very good job at making sure that everyone feels supported in their journey. Um, and I think being able to mobilize groups of high school students um, locally is the place to start and getting that conversation going so they're more motivated when they can vote. Oh, I'm definitely showing up. Like I know that they need to hear my voice and they need to know that I am a group they need to cater to. Um, and so yeah, that's what I would recommend. Thank you. <laughs> this next question is for Rudy. Um, we've got an audience member that's saying, it's frustrating when I try to research candidates on sites like Voter 411, and often um, there's not a lot of information from the candidates on there. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? How can, um, how can our audience members research candidates and know that the information that they're getting is accurate? Well, I think Barbara mentioned a terrific resource. The, the League has a, has a great voter guide um, that is, uh, you know, I think, and Barbara, you can correct me on this, if, if, the questions are by office, right? So everybody has to answer the same questions. Uh, my newspaper, DallasNews.com, also has a, a similar voter guide. We ask somewhat different questions. Ours, ours is subscriber-based, obviously. Um, we, we try to pay the journalists who work for us. Um, that's pretty, pretty important that they be able to pay their rent. Uh, but look, I, I, one, one of the things that I think is, is really uh, Im, important for, for, for everyone, but that I really hope young people will uh, re-engage, is there, there are institutions that have had a long history of good service. Um, you may sometimes disagree with them. Uh, certainly people disagree with my newspaper uh, and our editorial board sometimes. That's great. People should disagree. We live in a democracy. Uh, the League is a terrific social organization that has just done uh, democracy activism for a long, long, long time. And they do it really well. So find those places that are outside of, I think, algorithmically determined uh, information, you know, um, and, 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 and oftentimes those are, those are better sources. Thank you so much. All right, this next question is um, for the group. Um, so do you feel COVID, the, the pandemic, uh, had an effect on voter turnout? 
uh, early voting is um, supposedly down in Texas right now. Why do you feel like that is? Is it because of the pandemic? I've, I've studied voter um, turnout uh, over in, in, in our North Texas counties and in, in the state at, at large, and certainly uh, the pandemic has an impact. But I will, I will tell you that um, voter turnout is primarily affected by people's excitement about individual candidates. And so if you look historically at the uh, Obama presidency, uh, turnout was uh, very much uh, elevated. Um, the 2016 presidential election turnout was very much elevated. People had uh, obviously strong feelings about that. And then the 2018 midterm election, um, when Beto O'Rourke uh, first ran for Senate, uh, that was energizing to voters. Um, I think that this year's depressed turnout is probably less likely a pandemic impact than it is a sort of general uh, lack of enthusiasm. Thank you. You have others have different points of view, Barbara. Yeah, mm -hmm. Some things, some other thoughts on that, because I. We're finding that young people actually are quite enthusiastic, um, uh, but there also are um, uh, the voting obstacles that I've talked about, and they're really quite, um, they, you know, they've, since the last election, we had SB1, and there are a whole new layer of uh, obstacles. It's uh, harder to assist elderly voters. I have friends that have had to do this, and it's very difficult. Um, it's much harder to vote by mail. It's almost impossible to read the, um, the application to vote by mail. Uh, I, answer the, I answer phone calls all the time. People call in, and there's teams of us that call people back with answers, and I talk to people on the phone, and people say, I'm 85, and I cannot read this vote by mail application. And I say, I'm 60, and I can't read the vote by mail application. <laughs> I, it, you know, there, and there are, um, right now, we are starting a little database of um, out-of-state college students, and whether they have managed to vote by mail. And so far, I have 10 people in my little spreadsheet, and I've got nine that can't get it done, I think. We'll, we'll find out, and one that could. So, um, you know, there are just, you know, 85% of the people in Colorado um, have voted in the last, in the 2020 election. And in our best case ever, where everybody was energized in Texas, we had it got to about 66%. So that's, you know, 3 million people in Texas. That, you know, I, and I, I definitely reject the concept that people are lazy. Um, I don't think Texans are lazier than Coloradans. I think that uh, we have obstacles that they don't have, and um, it's real. So right now, I think we have a mix of energy going on, and I think we have uh, more obstacles than we had before. So I think we have, you know, we have competing things going on in terms of turnout. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. And um, so we have time for one more question, and I think, I think this is one that all of you can answer. Um, talking about politics is not for the weak. Um, so big round of applause for you guys for even, for even, being, <laughs> for even being here and um, your careers focusing on politics. How do you have these controversial conversations with voters as nonpartisan without it getting to a heated place? Or does it get to a heated place? It definitely can. Yeah. <laughs> I can speak for Citizens Founder Lobby. We, um, we try our best, like I said, we try to find that middle ground. And like historically, like I said, we've supported the carbon fee and dividend. Um, and we still very much support that, and we feel like people who are more on the left typically, you know, support it. People on the right um, may fear that the government is in their hands, but it's, it's not that. They still have the freedom to do what they want. It's just if you're polluting more than this, this is what will happen. You're going to have to start paying for it. Um, and so we try to support and create good dialogue for how we can find solutions that are good for both sides and how can we start that conversation and make sure that we're being respectful, we are being empathetic because not everyone is as educated on these topics, um, and 
more importantly, we really try to put action behind what we do and just create that space for people to be curious and for people to take that action in their own hands to um, support climate policy. Yeah. And we're, we're really just trying to empower people to use their voice in the process. So we don't spend too much time, we don't spend any time really talking about politics per se. We are really talking about the process and the confidence and getting people to where they can feel like they can participate in democracy. So from our standpoint, it's, we, don't, we don't get into that. We always, we'll help everyone. We want everyone to participate. We think that's how it's supposed to work. I envy you. Well, <laughs> <laughs> because we, we, do, we do take positions, you know. We, we do, at the end of the day, a pick. And uh, this year, uh, our editorial board recommended uh, 22 Democrats, and we recommended 19 Republicans. We tried to sit down with every single candidate uh, where, we, where we made a recommendation. We don't, um, we don't see the world as... Uh, or, or, or issues, many of the issues that we argue over are simple. Um, many people, and I respect their points of view, but they have very uh, clearly defined perspectives on, on issues. Um, we live in a political binary. You know, you have to vote for this person or that person uh, very often at the end of the day, and that is how our, how our democracy works. I think the the space uh, outside of that binary is the important place that we really spend a lot of our time writing and thinking. Um, our politics doesn't represent the complexity of our democracy. And I think that if people would reflect on that more often, they would step out of the political binary into which we're forced and have a much better time uh, making connection sort of outside of the echo chambers that Anaya mentioned. Um, it's difficult. Uh, we, 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 we live in a, in a world that promotes the kind of uh, the differences over the commonalities. Uh, it's challenging to overcome that, but I think it's our responsibility as citizens to do so. Thank you so much. Um, well, we're, we're going to have to end it here. I wish we could keep going. Um, but uh, just before, before we break, would you guys like to um, uh, just take this time to promote your organizations and your publication? Just so how can people keep up with what um, your organizations are doing? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah, if, if you wouldn't mind saying your name again in your organization as well. <laughs> yeah. So again, my name is Anaya Henderson. Thank you all for having me. I teach at Molina High School, and some of my students actually do classes at Dallas College, which is incredible. So um, yeah, my name is Anaya Henderson. I volunteer with Citizens Climate Lobby. Um, and how you can get involved, I would recommend you just go to the Citizens Climate Lobby website and um, sign up through there. There will be a welcome volunteer if you're, if you're interested, and we can get you started because we want anyone and everyone who's motivated and passionate about climate. And again, I'm Barbara Larkin with the League of, the League of Women Voters of Dallas. Um, the League of Women Voters also has the League of Women Voters of Texas and a League of, League of Women Voters U.S. So we have actually, and we have the vote411.org, which is our voters' guide. So we have four websites. <laughs> um, so uh, the League of Women Voters of Dallas website is lwbdallas.org. Um, we would encourage anyone that has any voting questions or wants to volunteer with us, sign up. We're almost all volunteers. And um, we would love to have you come, go to our website, and you go to our website and click on participate and volunteer. We always have shifts of places we're going to register voters and educate voters and work with the community and work at the colleges. Um, so we would love to have you come join us in that effort. My name is Rudy Bush, I'm editorial page editor for the Dallas Morning News, which has the largest newsroom of any news organization in the state of Texas. And I'm here because our editorial board is a 100% supporter of Dallas College and its mission. Thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists. <laughs> Thank you.